Wonderful. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here for a very lovely occasion here at the Osser Institute at a difficult time of year with poor weather and a variety of illnesses ravaging uh, the land. And I'm getting the thumbs up that the, the mic is working. We are being recorded. Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We have the launch of a book with an extremely special panel this afternoon. I don't want to take time away from the panel. Um, I'm going to hand the floor over a minute to introduce the esteemed guests who will be speaking today. I do want to acknowledge the three people who have made this possible. They are the editors of the book, one of whom is at the table, and that is Dr. Sarah Mead. Um, the others are Dr. Benjamin Sampson, as well as uh, Edgardo Sobenes, who unfortunately can't be with us today. And so I will say one additional word for the person who can't be with us. Edgardo has a long relationship with Osser. He's been a special person to work with. It's through him that I've got to know Benjamin and now Sarah, and it's really a special thing to be able to host the book. And I think the collection of people they brought together to discuss it attests to that. I'm looking very forward. I hope you are as well. Thanks. I hand it over to Benjamin. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, and thank you for uh, being here. Uh, just a few words of uh, thanks to start, so to the authors of the of the book for their contribution to Sarah Mead and uh, and Edgardo, who can't make it today. Um, the quality of their their contribution has made the the, the this book uh, possible. I will also thank the ASA Institute, of course, for publishing the, the book and uh, hosting the event today, as well as the Club de Droit, who will um, who has supported the event and will uh, offer you some drinks at the at the end of the of the discussion. Uh, finally, our panelists, of course, I will introduce them in a in a in a short while. Uh, but before I will maybe give some basic information about the. But the book, um, which we celebrate today, uh, if only to, to encourage you to acquire it, um, a chase word to say bye. Uh, it comprises uh, 22 chapters introduced by uh, Philippe Gauthier, the current register to um, the International Court of Justice, and concluded by Philippe Couvreur, the former, uh, register to the International Court of uh, Justice. The others are all um, rising or confirmed academic or practitioners from various background and um, and um, and uh, from almost all around the world. It's the book is structured in three parts, which are also three three different layers of, of perspective, I would say, because the first uh, canvas the vast majority of uh, the um, the court and the inter the international, regional, and transnational courts and, and tribunals. And for each of them, the, the their respective authors have discussed their strengths, witness, uh, weaknesses, and also um, the way they grasp environmental issues, the way they handle environmental disputes um, through their their mandate, whether it is uh, very directly like the ITLOS uh, through their uh, provisional measures um, directed at the protection of the environment, or uh, more indirectly as a human rights court, for for example. Taking a, se a step back, the second uh, part, and and as well a uh, layer of perspective is um, is composed with uh, cross for our studies on specific issues in uh, environmental proceedings so jurisdiction procedural issues evidence responsibility all of this is is covered in the in the second part and that time looking around international courts and tribunals the last uh, part examines the role of different actors and other actors, such as um, compliance mechanisms in uh, multilateral environmental um, agreements, the UN Security Council, and uh, national courts. The book, we may say, is comprehensive, but maybe not exhaustive, as uh, the um, uh, actuality uh, made us aware of the, the work of the Human Rights Committee recently in September through the Islanders uh, case, and, and uh, also new, uh, new in the, in the um, uh, landscape is the, the new dispute resolution service at the World Bank. 
who's also addressing environmental uh, issues uh, more and more now. Some would say it's a lack in the book. I would say it's an opportunity to have a second edition, although I know that Sarah is not yet ready to <laughs> hear about a second edition. But I think it will be warranted in a, in a near future. <laughs> I will not take you through to each of the 22 chapters, the introduction and the conclusion, of course. I will just uh, limit myself to three uh, small observations, maybe to introduce the, the discussion. First, I think the book reminds us that uh, however important and dramatic it is, climate change is not the only threat to the environment. As we, as we, we list some of these uh, other threats in the, in the in the four words. And in the earlier, you have the threat to biodiversity, uh, both inland, on sea, and also in the air, artificialization of soils, acidification of oceans, deforestation, plastic um, debris, air, water, and land pollution. What a landscape. Second, um, no matter how specialized is the court the, or the tribunal, the environment always finds its way in the, in the courtroom. And that, I think, shows us that, uh, or confirms, because all of us know that all human activities have impact on the environment. Um, and if we, if we take a further step backward, it, it shows that uh, we, you, as human being, individual or as institution, are bound to uh, to the environment, and maybe we could argue that beyond the resolution of the specific dispute or the specific, um, yeah, this specific dispute at end, um, the role of international court and tribunal is maybe to, um, if not restore this bond when it is broken, at least to remind the individual or the institution concerned by the dispute that such a uh, bound uh, exists. And uh, last, uh, last uh, point is uh, that it has been a bit frustrating, I must say, to uh, work on this, uh, on this book, certainly not because of the authors of my lovely co-editors, um, but because you realize that you, there are many international courts and tribunals dealing with the environment, but there are also so many limitations to what they can actually do, whether it's because of the uh, limited jurisdiction, personal or substantial, or because of their, their means um, that they have. And I have uh, in mind, of course, time, um, because almost everything with the environment is urgent. And for international courts and tribunals, the only urgent proceedings that they have, I think, today is provisional measures. And that's uh, very little compared to the, the work that needs to be done. Uh, this uh, is maybe a good uh, point to raise the question of their effectiveness and whether they can do anything to help the, the environment to be protected. Um, but I will um, very courageously refrain from uh, answering that question. That's for them. So we, the discussion will be uh, handled by our panel and then with you uh, through uh, Q and A's if, you, if, you, if you'd like. Um, let me introduce them. The, the discussion will be opened, I think, or I decided, uh, by Professor Mabadou Ebier. <laughs> 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 Aside of being a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Ebier is an associate professor at uh, yeah. <laughs> Leiden University. He also served, uh, he also an international practitioner. He served as uh, the special assistant to the president of the ICJ, Abdul Kawi Yusuf. And uh, he has been part, still part, I think, of uh, litigation teams before the ICJ. It loss and uh, investor states um, disputes. Uh, Mamadou will be followed by Saramid, again my decision, <laughs> who is the co-director of the Climate Litigation Network, a project of the Organda Foundation, and she is also one of the co-editor of the book, and the co-editor of another book, uh, if I'm correct, the Judicial Handbook on Climate Litigation which is an ongoing research project uh, with the World Commission of Environmental Law. 
And if this information is not, uh, I've not made you realize that uh, she is a specialist in international environmental law and uh, human rights. And I, if I may uh, take this opportunity to, for uh, personal notes, uh, first, to tell her that it's been a pleasure to uh, co-edit the book with you. And although the work started in 2018, we uh, only met in person two months ago. And to thank her also because the preparation of the book collided with the end of another important project of mine. And Sarah took upon her some of my assignment as editor, so it's an opportunity to thank her. It will then be my pleasure because I will also moderate the panel, another decision, to give the floor to Sumera Aslan, who is an international lawyer, uh, who is currently working uh, with the World Youth uh, for Climate Justice, if I'm correct. Uh, she has worked for the Center of International Environmental Law as well, uh, and, but your, your work mostly now is to support the, the campaign through the uh, advisory opinion before the ICJ. Finally, uh, Monsieur le Juge, Philippe Couvreur, who will do us the honor to conclude today's um, discussion. His Excellency was the former registrar of the, of the ICJ and is now acting as an ad hoc judge uh, before, well, with the courts, and as well as an uh, exit arbitrator, author of numerous publications um, and lecturer in many universities and various academic institutions in the world. Uh, without further ado, um, I now give the floor to Mamedouf. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin, for uh, picking me first. I wasn't expecting it. I thought that it would be rather uh, His Excellency who will be speaking first, and that I will be able to enjoy their speech, his speech before uh, taking the floor. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the organizers for inviting me to this uh, conversation today on the effectiveness of international courts and tribunals for the with respect to the protection of the environment. And secondly, I would like to really thank the, uh, congratulate all the editors and the contributors to this marvelous volume, because uh, editing editors, at least edited volumes tend to be different in quality. When they are not well conceived as a single project, you tend to have different chapters talking about different issues without a clear line through the different chapters. And uh, for this one, the editors have been able to really go uh, to think first their project and then get several contributors, excellent contributors uh, to make this volume. So I'm really look forward to having my copy. And thank you for uh, having me. So when Benjamin asked me to address this issue of how effective are international courts and tribunals with the protection of the environment, I was a little bit lost. I didn't know where to start. So I said, OK, let's start by defining the keywords. Because if you manage to define the keywords, we'll be able to come to uh, conclusion, or not, even not a conclusion, but at least we'll be able to track what is the issue that we are trying to, uh, to address. And I realized that this topic can be understood in different ways by different people. Because when you say effective, what do you mean? Especially if you relate it to tribunals and court, knowing that tribunals may contribute to the development, the clarification of international law, but knowing also that sometimes their uh, decisions may have actual effect on the ground. So when you say effective, is it effective, effectiveness in contributing to uh, the development of the law relating to the protection of the environment, or is it effective as to addressing the issues, environmental issues that we all have in mind? That's one. Uh, problem. The second problem, when you say international courts and tribunal, you are referring to a heterogeneous category. You have interstate uh, dispute settlement tribunals, the court, it laws, 
WTO, although it's not a, a such typically a tribunal, but you are also referring to uh, human rights courts and tribunal. I see that the book refers to the ICC, which is also an international tribunal. So can you come to a single answer as to the effectiveness of all these different tribunals with respect to uh, the protection of the environment? And you also even have to include the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is also based on a, on a, on a treaty. Then I decided, okay, let me move to a simpler term <laughs> that I may easily define and get to a conclusion, which is the protection of the environment. But then I realized that even the protection of the environment is not a simple term to define because you can have at least two understanding of it. You may have uh, environmental disputes which involve the interest primarily, let me put it that way, primarily the interest of two or three states. So it is their main interest, it is a shared river between the two, and their dispute is, relates to the protection of the environment. But then you also have climate change, which is a different animal in the sense that uh, it triggers the interests of the international community, including future generations. So you see that each and every term of today's uh, discussion is controversial. And my answer to the question, so how effective are international courts and tribunal with the protection of the environment is, it depends, <laughs> you see? But if I say this and leave, I'm sure that Benjamin will be asking me, Mamadou, where are you going? <laughs> Come back here. What are you doing? <laughs> yes, so I won't go anywhere. But I try to answer, to structure my answer at, uh, at three levels, really three different levels. And uh, let's start first with the contribution that uh, international tribunal can play in the development and clarification of international law rules uh, relating to the protection of the environment. That's something that tribunals do. Tribunals contribute to the development and the clarification of the rules of uh, international law. And I will really try to avoid the entire academic discussion as to whether uh, there is judge-made law or not. And simply notice that whenever an international tribunal pronounces itself on a legal issue, later you cannot discuss that legal issue without referring to its uh, holding, to its assessment of what the law is. You may agree with it, you may disagree with it, but it becomes an element of the legal discourse that is coming to take place. And since we are in a system where uh, state hardly adopt treaties in order to challenge tribunals, interpretation of the law, then it means that it remains on the, as part of the legal discourses on the issue and participate uh, in shaping them. So when you look, for instance, at the jurisdiction of the, at, as far as the ICJ is concerned, the court has made substantial contribution to international law, especially in the period where the law was not so dense as it is today. So think, for instance, about the entire regime governing reservation to treaties, 1951. At that time, we don't have the 1969 Vienna Convention, and the court crafts an entire framework governing uh, reservation to treaties. Or think about the legal personality of international organization. We are dealing with a social uh, issue. There is no clear or authoritative text which tells you what is the answer. The court steps in and is able to articulate what is uh, what are the legal rules uh, applicable? And here the, you can make the relation with the environment, with the protection of the environment. Again, we have a social issue. We have some general principles. 
And courts may play a role in detailing what is the exact meaning of the principles, the general principles that we all know with respect to the environment. Think about uh, compensation for uh, environmental harm. So Costa Rica, Nicaragua, when the court comes in and say the general principle of state responsibility are applicable to reparation for environmental harm. And then when the court goes into detailing uh, the specific application of uh, general international law to these issues, it works. It contributes to the clarification of the law and it's uh, become useful as far as the protection of the environment is concerned. In this context, my guess is that uh, advisory opinions are more useful to participate in the development of the law than contentious cases. In contentious cases, the court's hands is somewhat tied to the legal issues that it has to decide. Of course, there are judges who believe that they have to uh, develop international law more than others who are uh, more minimalistic, but uh, I think we will all agree that the, court, the court's hand are uh, tied with respect to the issues that, are, uh, that, that it has to, um, to, to decide. And when you look at the practice of the court, you will see that really some of the major contribution that the court did to the development of international law, its clarification occurred uh, in advisory pro uh, proceedings. So, let me now move uh, to my second ways in which international courts and tribunal may contribute uh, to the protection of the environment. So the first one, they can contribute to the elaboration of the norm, their clarification, their, their, their development. Secondly, tribunals can contribute to the protection of the environment, but removing by removing uncertainties that may exist in the legal relation between the parties. You take, for instance, uh, Argentina versus Uruguay. The parties want to know whether the constructions of the pulp mills will have an environmental impact on the Rio Uruguay, under the statute of the Rio Uruguay. You have an uncertainty. You have a dispute between the parties. A court can intervene in such a context and tell them this is what your these are these are your environmental obligations with respect to this uh, river, and the fact that the parties are clear about their environmental obligation helps them in protecting uh, a little bit more uh, in complying with their environmental obligation. Just a couple of days ago, Bolivia versus Chile. What are the what is the status of the waters of the Silala? Is it a domestic water course? Is it an international water course? What does this qualification mean for the rights and obligation of the parties? So then when the court steps in and characterizes the river as an international river, it removes uncertainty, it clarifies the dispute and allows the parties uh, to, to, to protect uh, their, uh, the, the the, the environment. But then the question may arise as to whether the parties are going to comply with the judgment of the court or different courts or tribunals. And there you have to make a difference between interstate courts and tribunal and other type of tribunals. Because as far as interstate courts and tribunals are concerned, one thing that you know is that there are judgment, even in contentious cases, tend to be uh, respected, tend to be complied with. It was stated that the court had all the ICJ, but here I speak on the, the control of uh, His Excellency, that you had almost 97% uh, rate of, satisfy of compliance with the ICJ judgment. And you may be wondering why. The reason is primarily due to the fact that the jurisdiction of the court is based on consent. In the large majority of cases, when states come to the court, they consented to. When the judgment is rendered, 
they comply with it. It makes sense from the beginning till the end. And second reason why state tend to consent uh, to comply with the court's uh, judgment is in my view due to the fact that when they come to before interstate tribunals and courts, sometimes they are engaging in a dialogue with their domestic audience. Burkina Faso and Mali have a border dispute. Okay, we won't give it to Mali. I'm from Burkina Faso. The, okay. So any state representative who will decide that, okay, Mali take it, the person will have difficulties. So we say, let's go to the court. We go to the court. The court says it belongs to Mali. And then you can engage with your domestic audience and tell them, you see, it's not us. It's just this, these people in the Hague. They didn't understand anything. And you are fine. But you use the court as a tool in order to be able to do things that you already realize should be, should be done. So that's the reason when you see, for instance, uh, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, the judgment has been complied with, I think within three months after its issuance, as far as the compensation uh, was concerned. So you have that aspect. But what I said here may not be relevant if tribunals are seized through unilaterally, through unilateral applications. But even then, when you look at the, uh, at the uh, compliance rate for interstate tribunals and courts, you see that uh, it works. And there you have to call, in addition to the two elements that I just mentioned, you have to include in your thinking the authority of the tribunals the fact that a state that doesn't comply with its uh, obligations, including uh, international judgment, lose a sense of credibility, is not seen as a reliable uh, partner. And uh, so that could be one example. I will just stay for a moment on human rights courts and tribunal, because that's where all you have a lot of the, invest of the environmental disputes being brought nowadays. The problem is that when you look at these tribunals, the compliance rate is extremely low. It's extremely low. For the African Court on Human and People's Rights, you are around 20%. And similar numbers for the European Court on Human Rights, et cetera. So when you look at it from that perspective, you see, therefore, a difference between interstate courts and tribunal and non-interstate courts and tribunal where of course, you can bring a unilateral uh, application against a state, but then it translates into more difficulties in having uh, the judgment uh, eventually enforced. Final thing that I would like to say. So I said that investment, uh, not investment, environmental, <laughs> uh, uh, international courts and tribunals play uh, an important role in clarifying uh, and developing the law. I also say that they play an important role in uh, removing uncertainties as far as the legal relation between the parties are concerned. I just want to close by cautioning against an over-reliance on the role of international courts and tribunal. First disclaimer, I am from the civil law tradition. I'm from a civil law tradition, and for us, if you have a judge and you have the parliament, there is a reason into it, you know? So judges should do adjudication, and the parliament should do the legislative work. So that might be a bias. That's an argument I give away. Now, but why do I think that we have to be very, very careful about uh, over relying upon judges even to develop the law. The reason is the following. Judges can get it wrong. And when they get it wrong, it's difficult to correct. It's very, very difficult to correct. If I ask this room, is it lawful to use or to try to use nuclear weapons. Very good student in the room will all refer to 
1996 advisory opinion. And they will give exactly what the court said. But did you realize that the 1996 advisory opinion was rendered a quarter of a century ago? And that within a quarter of a century, everything evolved. Those who were, I don't know, one at that time, they are 22 today. Or no, 26? 26 today. They are 26 today. Yeah. So, but why do you believe that law should be the only phenomenon that remains fixed? So that's one thing. Tribunals and courts are very good, but they have this power of crystallizing the state of law and making it difficult to continue evolving. I would prefer if I had to discuss this question of the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapon to go through state practice, go through the General Assembly, see what states are saying there, how they are reacting to each other claims without having to address the 1996 advisory opinion. So that's one uh, element that we have to, uh, to, to consider. Of course, people will say, yes, but state may still adopt treaties which will uh, overrule uh, the findings of tribunal. They will point to UNCLOS, which overruled the Lotus, uh, the Lotus case as far as the uh, offenses committed on the high seas were concerned and who can prosecute, whether it is the state of the flag or if it is uh, any other state. But that's one case. If you think about it, the, only, the other case I found where the tribunal was overruled concerning, concerned the GATT and the case in relation to Spain. So it's very rare that states take upon themselves, okay, investment law is a specific field nowadays, but it's very rare for state to take upon themselves to conclude a treaty in order to be able to overrule a wrong decision rendered by, uh, by a tribunal. So when we are thinking about, uh, about uh, an advisory opinion on climate change before the court, I say it's good. It's very good. And it may help contribute to the development and the clarification of a state's international environmental obligation with respect to climate change. But I will really suggest that when you are deciding as to whether we should ask an advisory opinion or not, think about also, what if the advisory opinion goes in a way different from what we want? You have, to, you, have to, you have to make a balance out of uh, both uh, possibilities. You cannot just go to the court and say, we expect you to give us everything we want and don't consider the possibility that the court will say, no, I don't agree with you. And then what would you do? So in my view, although courts and tribunal are very important, we have to think about them as an element of an ecosystem, an element of an ecosystem. And in that ecosystem, you have to include the role of domestic courts, because domestic courts and tribunals, when they issue their different judgment, they contribute into shaping states' views on what the law is. And those judgments can be enforced at the domestic level. I will also venture to suggest that you have to think about elections because elections are the only moment where you and I can decide who will be representing us at the international level. And if we decide to vote Trump, it's not the same thing as if you vote, well, it's very difficult <laughs> with these politicians <laughs> to find someone who will really embody everything you believe in. So, but you see, if you vote Trump, it can be very different from voting someone else. And all this is part of uh, the effectiveness of international law. So for me, when we think about the effectiveness of international law, we should not just think about it in the abstract. We have to put 
international law, international courts and tribunal as part of a global society, which involves states, which involves individuals, UNI, tribunals, NGOs, civil society, and see how in a complementary fashion, they can all contribute to global goals. And I think that I spoke more than I had to. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mamadou, for these uh, talk provocative uh, <laughs> words uh, and for putting things into, into perspective. I think the discussion on the advisory opinion now is, uh, uh, <laughs> is getting serious. Um, I give the floor to Sarah Mid now, who will most certainly think about that as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I should, um, yeah, thank you very much to Esther for hosting us and to Benjamin. And I should clarify at the start that I am not a doctor. Uh, it, if it was that easy to get a PhD, then then that would be great. But while while Benjamin was, was toiling away at his PhD, that was why I was able to do more on the book. So <laughs> um, yeah, so just to clarify, um, I am coming at this as a practitioner. I am um, well, I, I have uh, worked briefly at Leiden University. I am a New Zealand trained lawyer. I work at the Climate Litigation Network and we support uh, legal teams around the world that are bringing climate litigation against their governments. So I'm very much, you could say, um, at the national level primarily, but we obviously um, in those cases draw a lot on international environmental law and other um, forms of international law like international human rights law and so on. So that is where I come to this discussion from. And it will be one of those awkward debates where I actually agree a lot with <laughs> Mabadu, who I'm supposed to be disagreeing with, insofar as I, uh, there, yeah, my conclusions will, will have some similarities. And I think it's really great then that we can share from a slightly different perspective um, some um, some observations on the on the debate. And then it'll be great for Sumeda to um, to then take us more in detail on, on what the ICJ advisory opinion might be able to offer. So with that introduction, um, I think what's also important and, and, and coming at it from as a climate litigator, um, to also put it in context of where we're at with the environmental crises, because it's very often that we sit in these debates and we can sort of intellectualize uh, these issues and, and forget quite how serious a position that we are in. So I'm sure uh, in this um, audience, I needn't, I needn't go here, but I think it always helps to, to, to sort of anchor um, our observations. So we're looking at the moment at a triple planetary crisis, which has existential proportions which means that we're not dealing with one particular area of international law. We're dealing with so many different parts of international law because we've sort of moved beyond uh, one small specific issue to a situation where um, we are facing um, ecosystem collapse, which means that um, yeah, many of our human rights um, will, be, will be implicated. So, um, I think the other aspect of these environmental crises is that they raise really significant global justice concerns. So um, we are also facing a situation where adjudicating these cases at a national level, while in my view has proven to be very successful, and we can go into that, has its limitations insofar as it, the jurisdictional limitations of any national court are limited usually to, to that particular jurisdiction. Um, but the problem with particularly, uh, let's say, the climate crisis is that it extends far beyond any one jurisdiction and, and, has, and means that we need to uh, look at how we can employ extraterritorial um, opportunities. And the global justice implications mean that those who have contributed least to the environmental problems that we have today will obviously suffer the most from, from um, the environmental crises. But... 
make no mistake, we will obviously all be affected. I think it was amazing that it didn't really make more news in Europe this year, that 20,000 people died across Western Europe in the summer's heat waves in temperatures that would have been virtually impossible without climate breakdown. So we're already facing a situation in Europe where the climate crisis is really impacting on the right to life of us, of our grandparents in particular. And so um, I think it, yeah, it just pays to keep in mind um, the proportions of the problem, uh, which was also obviously the reason for, for doing a book on, on environmental protection. Uh, obviously, concerted efforts have been made to resolve these problems through uh, intergovernmental processes. And uh, that would be the ideal situation that we would have resolved these problems uh, via the intergovernmental process. So uh, we have the biodiversity COP underway at Montreal at the moment. We have the, uh, we had COP in uh, Sharm el Sheikh, where I was a couple of weeks ago. But while significant progress was made in relation to the impacts of climate change, so loss and damage, very little was said on mitigation, which means we find ourselves in 2022 in a situation where we're likely to see warming of 2.6 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, with very little, limited window of time to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which we agreed in the Paris Agreement. So, it is in that context that we are therefore <laughs> left to look at what international courts and tribunals can offer us. And I think it is exactly the same as a national climate litigation. Going to the courts is never a first resort. If there was a different option, it would be chosen. Um, it's never, it's um, risky, it's expensive, it's lengthy. And that is probably exactly the same at the international level as it is at the national level. But find as we do ourselves in the situation, I think it's very timely to have um, a conversation about what ICTs can offer us in terms of environmental protection. And I would like to briefly take stock of where we're at. And in that, I largely agree with uh, Mamadou. And then uh, look ahead at what our biggest opportunities are and what as civil society, so where, where, where I come from, um, we see as the opportunities and obviously the risks. Um, but ultimately, I will conclude um, optimistically. So um, if we take stock, I think it's fair to say, as Mamadou said, that there simply hasn't probably been an opportunity for us to see what ICTs or international courts and tribunals can truly offer us in protecting the environment. So if you look at the book, there is um, our authors have done an amazing job. It's OK. And in, um, in, in canvassing how each international court and tribunal has dealt with the environment. And it is admittedly, in most cases, relatively piecemeal because they are presented with very specific disputes with very specific facts and they do a very uh, good effort, um, uh, the court or, or, or tribunal, in, in assessing those facts and then, and then making a decision. But it will be, I think, an advisory opinion which really offers the opportunity for the court to look at the whole body of law that's available um, and the whole uh, body of facts and, and decide how international law might be able to offer something um, in terms of global environmental protection. But where we have seen uh, progress um, is, the in, in, is some of the human rights bodies, so particularly the Inter-American uh, Human Rights Body and their advisory opinion, number 23. It lost, has also issued a helpful advisory opinion. And then, surprisingly, the UN Human Rights Treaty bodies, which I don't know what we were thinking when we didn't include them in the book, because when I was <laughs> preparing for this, I thought, oh my gosh, the main thing I'm going to be talking about is UN Human Rights Treaty bodies, uh, as they have um, at least been the most engaged on the issue. And we have seen, I think here, we can start to see how we might be able, how the ICJ or ITLOS or whichever body is, is, is asked to prepare an advisory opinion, uh, what they can truly offer in terms of pulling together the very many different areas of law to answer the question about what states international law obligations are. And we saw that in the Saki um, in Argentina, yeah, the complaint that was brought uh, to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child by 16 children against five states where the committee 
there uh, made some helpful observations around children's rights in relation to climate change, although ultimately dismissed the case, uh, the, the complaint on non-exhaustion of domestic remedies. But then again, we saw them go a little bit further in the Torres Strait case um, with the Human Rights Committee finding that Australia was in breach of the complainant's right to culture in private and family life. And what I find interesting about that decision is how the committee draws on international environmental law to interpret international human rights law. And that is where we can really start to see some, um, some progress and optimism. So looking ahead, I think there haven't been the opportunities to date, but there will likely be in the future. We are going to have a very exciting year or two ahead for those of us that work in this field. Um, Sumeda will uh, enlighten us more on the ICJAO and the prospects of having a request going to the court. Uh, but we also have the European Court of Human Rights um, that will hear three cases on the 29th of March um, before the Grand Chamber. Uh, where they will be asked what essentially are the states um, under, well, yeah, the state's obligations are under the European Convention of Human Rights in light of climate change. Whether they address that substantive uh, on the merits remains to be seen. I, I think at least two of the cases face considerable, uh, admin well, procedural hurdles. But in any case, we will, I, I, I think it's very likely that we will see the court uh, making really important findings in relation to what the convention offers, um, uh, what, the, what protection the convention offers uh, individuals uh, within the jurisdiction of those bound by the European Convention of Human Rights. And I will go on to why I think there is some optimism there um, in, in a moment. But the other uh, body which I think offers some, uh, op well, it is possible, is it loss. So there has been a um, an organization established, the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law. Um, which has uh, within its mandate the express authority to ask it loss for an advisory opinion on matters related to international law and climate change. So there we could also see another opportunity for the development of uh, international law. My reason for some optimism um, is because uh, I work in the field of national climate litigation, and I think that they provide a lot of, they have done a lot of the groundwork that international courts and tribunals can now draw on. And so in that respect, um, originally, um, there was some, I would say, caution uh, among the national climate litigators with the prospect of an advisory opinion, because there was this sense that we don't know what we would get and we're actually getting some really positive jurisprudence from national courts and decisions that can be uh, enforced at the national level. Um, obviously that's come out of the Netherlands but we've also seen very positive jurisprudence out of many other European states and also outside of Europe. So, for example, the Dutch Supreme Court, the German Constitutional Court, uh, a first instant court in Belgium, in Czech, uh, several of these courts have found that climate taking action on climate change is a legal duty and a legal duty that requires the government to, to, to take uh, protective measures. So um, I think, though, if we reflect on that, we can confidently um, have some confidence that the international courts and tribunals would at least uh, confirm what has been done at the national level. Um, I will conclude by, by simply saying that uh, while uh, that presented with the right opportunity, I think that we can expect ICTs to rise to the challenge that these global problems demand global responses. We can only expect so much from national courts because they have their jurisdictional limitations. And as try as we might, we still um, are having real difficulties in, in getting around those jurisdictional limitations at the national level. And failure to rise to the challenge will inevitably bring into question their legitimacy. I think that it is something for these international courts and tribunals to be very aware of. If they fail to, to engage with these issues and if they fail to draw on the enormous range of norms that they have that demand that, that, that further action needs to be taken to protect the global environment, 
they will face, I think, real uh, questions um, from particularly the most affected and most vulnerable states. Um, who are the vast majority of, of states. And I think the experience with the Energy Charter Treaty in recent days might be a word of caution. Um, I think that uh, what we've seen is that um, where there are sort of, not that that's the, oh, there hasn't been, um, hasn't been a decision on that, but we've seen that where there is a risk that there is, uh, that we're held up by, uh, by international law or by uh, arbitration bodies, that um, people, uh, that, that there's backlash. And at the moment we're seeing a lot of states um, pull out of the Energy Charter Treaty for a range of issues, but that is because of the fear of what arbitration, um, investment arbitration bodies could, could decide in relation to uh, the implications of that for domestic climate policy. So I will, um, I will leave it there. I've gone over my time, but I will hand over to Sumeda, who's going to take us more into a deep dive in relation to the ICJ. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to start by thanking for inviting us, for inviting us, but also me, me particularly here. It's a, it's a great opportunity to talk about the campaign and to talk about what we've done so far and where we're at. Uh, and of course, a huge congratulations to the authors, to Sarah, Benjamin, as well as Edgardo, who's not here. Um, to uh, get to this day, I'm sure it must not have been <laughs> an easy road. Um, start off with where I'm from and, and uh, start off an introduction. Uh, or first, let me let me give a structure on what I'll be discussing and then I'll move on to the introduction. So today I'll discuss the introduction to the campaign for an advisory opinion on, uh, at the International Court of Justice that has been mentioned by the other panelists, why we're doing this, how to get an advisory opinion, which I will not, of course, delve deep into with this panel, um, the legal questions that, that are on the table, the draft questions, and the added value in general, but also to the UNFCCC process. Um, so let me make an introduction now, um, or start off. Uh, so I'm from the World's Youth of Climate Justice. This is a global campaign that is seeking an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on uh, human rights and climate change. Um, the idea to seek an advisory opinion is not new. This has been attempted by the um, Republic of Palau in 2011, but has failed, in my opinion, due to it being uh, ahead of its time. Uh, there was no Paris Agreement, there was no uh, consensus on the threats of, of anthropogenic climate change, and so um, it had failed. But then in 2019, um, in, a, in, a, in a group of, of Pacific Island students that came together and discussed the idea of an advisory opinion on climate change and broadened the scope and built on this idea to ask a question on human rights and climate change. Um, and so uh, that was how the Pacific Island students fighting climate change existed and basically built a, a global campaign, um, which then led to the, to the um, establishment of the World Youth for Climate Justice that is uh, seeking this campaign. So that is a short introduction on on uh, on the campaign and how this has started and and where we're at basically. Why we're doing this is I think threefold, but I'll, I'll not not delve too long into the first question, which is the urgency to act now. I, I think Sarah has very eloquently um, uh, put out why we need to act and and the devastating effects of climate change around the world. And uh, the realization that this is just the beginning and it's not going to get any better if we're not acting quickly. Um, the second question why we're doing this is because the surge of lawsuits that Sarah mentioned that was inspired by the Urgenda case in 2019 um, um, is, is a great example of why we need um, why we need on international level guidance on what state obligations are in areas of human rights and climate change. So, so getting the two areas of, of, of affected areas by climate change basically together to, to give guidance to the national courts, because as Sarah said, these are limited on national level. The third reason why we are doing this and why Sarah has also explained um, is because uh, even if there are efforts on international level to address climate change, 
um, such as the, the Conference of, of Parties and UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, there have been that there haven't hasn't been much progress done because. Despite 50, 57 formal meetings, only now at COP27, there was a loss and damage fund established and the, the root causes of climate change was not, which is fossil fuels, addressing fossil fuels and, and reducing emissions. Um, so these are the three reasons why we are actually campaigning for an advisory opinion and why you think this is actually very much needed. Um, moving on to how to get an advisory opinion. One second. Based on Article 96 of the UN Charter, as well as uh, 65 of the Statute of the ICJ, the General Assembly is um, competent, basically, to, to ask to seek an advisory opinion. This will have to be voted for at the General Assembly sessions by a simple majority. Um, where we're at now with this campaign is um, there's a draft resolution on the table. There will be three consultations uh, by member states we are expecting them to be um, quite busy with discussing the, the scope of the questions, um, of which one will happen this week. Um, so that is where we're at. And moving on to the legal questions um, that are on the table right now. The first one is, what are the state obligations to ensure protect, protection of the climate system and environment for present and future generations under international law? And the second question is, what are the legal consequences of these state obligations as states have caused significant harm to the climate by their acts and emissions with respect to small island developing states, developing states and individuals of present and future generations? Now, I think these questions are, are sending out a great scope for the International Court of Justice to address climate change on a broader scale on, on different international law fields that, that um, develop in their own tracks to bring, bring together and, and interpret their, uh, the state obligations uh, in a holistic or in a, in a, in a uh, unified manner. And of course, uh, recognizing the, the limitations that Dr. Mamadou has, has just, um, uh, just uh, elaborated on, we believe that and hope that with the developments on national level, but also regional level, that this would be in a positive manner done by the International Court of Justice. Um, moving on to the added value of an uh, advisory opinion on climate change and human, human rights, um, be, on a general sense, in a general way. I think before we move on to um, what it will do or what added value it will give, it's important to say what it will not do. Um, the advisory opinion will not provide any le new legal obligations or, or legal pathways for uh, individuals to uh, seek climate justice. That should be clear. Um, what it will do, however, is provide a cross-jurisdictional perspective on climate change, allowing or connecting legal consequences to scientific consensus on anthropogenic climate change. So what human may, human, humans have contributed to, um, uh, to the climate crisis that is happening now. The second uh, added value in general would be that it provides legal certainty on what state obligations are. This would um, give uh, great authority in international courts, in all kinds of courts, actually, national courts, regional courts, international courts, um, on, on really what states are. And as Dr. Mamadou has, has so eloquently said, uh, the um, compliance rate of the International Court of Justice is quite high. So. Um, yeah, where, where the added value would then be that this would provide a legal certainty. The third one, um, the third added value of, of a uh, advisory opinion is that it would cement consensus on the scientific evidence of climate change. We know from the IPCC reports from the IEA scenarios that climate change is real and that the effects of climate change are devastating or, or destroying the world. Um, and having this recognized and really been uh, explained by an international court of justice, which just give a lot of authority to what we are saying and what we're asking. Um, and then I'll move on to the added value of a uh, advisory opinion to the UNFCCC process. Um, before I, I move on to the added value, I think it's important to, to state a few facts about the UNFCCC process and the advisory opinion, and then delve into the added value. Um, the first one would be that the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement are uh, interpreted under international law. So it's not separate. It, it is not 
separated from international law obligations, but used to interpret their um, the obligations stated on in the Paris Agreement, but also the UNFCCC. This, the second point that I wanted to raise is that an advisory opinion is developing and clarifying international law. And so, um, and another point that I wanted to raise is that within the, the backbone of the, the Paris Agreement, the UNFCCC, which are the negotiations going on each year, this year at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, is that there was no, uh, there, there is no discussion of legal questions or legal problems that are, that are, that are discussed within society. So in these negotiations, you don't see states negotiating, oh, but what is actually our legal, legal obligation in, in this situation or very little done. Um, and so taking all these points together, the added value of an advisory opinion would be that um, uh, the, the as the advisory opinion is developing and in, um, and uh, uh, developing and, and clarifying international law, it would provide a bedrock to these negotiations that are going on at the Paris, at the at the COP, at the Conference of Parties. It would limit the extreme positions that states are taking in these negotiations um, when discussing, for example, fossil fuels, when discussing uh, carbon markets, when discussing human rights violations, um, et cetera. So, in that sense. Having an advisory opinion, having clear and a clear answer on what state obligations are, would within the negotiations strengthen the position of states that are pro progressively wanting to um, protect the environment, be more ambitious, and and really uh, gain more um, gain more or do more to the to protect the environment, basically. Um, I could give an example that happened at COP27 that was uh, um, that is, I think, a great great example to to uh, state what an advisory opinion in that in that specific um, situation could do. So, at the end of COP27, there was a discussion on fossil fuels, including fossil fuels phase down and fossil fuel subsidies phase out uh, in the cover decision in the in the political decision that COP27 delivers. Um, but what the uh, 84, around 84 states had basically called out saying, yes, we support this and we want the, the wording of the fossil fuel phase down in the cover decision. But this didn't happen in the end. This was because there was a lot of pushback. And of course, partly because there was 636 lobbyists present at the COP. Um, but because states could actually take such a such an extreme position and say no, we we cannot actually put fossil fuels in there, or we don't want it because gas is is a, is a life source. Is as the African states are saying, it's some African states are saying, it's it's very very much needed to um, to to support life right now, especially with the crisis going on, the European crisis or the war that is going on right now. If the advisory opinion would give a clear um, answer on what state obligations are and what the the role of fossil fuels is, for example, uh, it would limit the the extreme positions that these states, for example, in the discussions or in negotiations, um, could take. And um, yeah, so this is an example of of how that could actually be be uh, effective. And so to conclude, basically, what we are seeking is that. Uh, to basically gain clear a clear answer on what state obligations are, but to also bring um, bring many parts of international law together to push states to do better. I'm so sorry to do better and to to be more ambitious. Thank you very much. As you prefer, I, I can try because there were so many things I can try to summarize now. And then because uh, I will improvise, I have not wanted to have something, you know, to read or to even try to summarize my own general conclusions. I think it's better to, to uh, start the discussion on what has been said here. And then, of course, we can continue the discussion with. Um, all the participants. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to take part in this discussion. And thank you so much for your very interesting uh, statements. Um, there are a lot of things, and I'm not going to discuss them all, but try to 
find a way through you to what you have said and and come to some conclusions uh, first of all uh, the, the starting point is and it is the obvious in matters like complex matters like environment and in particular climate change but it is generally true of course awareness is extremely important that is the starting point awareness of public opinions because at the end of the day not everywhere on the earth but in many countries public opinions have their weight and awareness is certainly the first uh, the first important point in ho in order to have states moving on uh, in different directions uh, there can be political actions, of course, but we are today talking about mainly courts and tribunals. So the, the main issue for courts and tri tribunals before deciding whether they are or are not efficient is to see what kind of legal instruments, what kind of legal framework they have at their disposal. And that is a question of political will of states. And this concerns both, of course, uh, domestic jurisdictions and, and, and international courts and tribunals. Because it is very easy to say, um, it is maybe so that judges uh, tend to be conservative, but uh, well, they have to apply an existing law. And uh, that law has to be made by states uh, both internally and externally through international agreements, customs, etc. And the judge, be it national or international, must have at its disposal something with which it can work and, and go ahead and develop the law as a judge should do. Now, if you look at uh, international environmental law as it is now, uh, I know that it is very often criticized. Uh, it uh, is fragmentary, it is volatile, it is um, made of a mixture of soft law and hard law. It, uh, it, it contains a lot of principles. Nobody knows exactly what is the legal content of those principles, etc. You know all those problems. So if the judges have the means to decide, to do their job, as Mamadou uh, reminded us, of clarifying the law, I think they will, uh, I'm rather optimistic about that when I see uh, the different courts and tribunals studied in the book. Uh, I think those who had real means to go ahead did so. Uh, I'm impressed by the African continent because the African continent was the first one to, to, to have real progressive texts which allowed judges thereafter to build on that and to, to go ahead. Since 1963, the Dar es Salaam Declaration, the Algiers uh, Convention, uh, and of course, the, the Charter of uh, Human and People's Rights, which for the first time refers to an individual right to an healthy environment. And that's uh, 1981, I think. So it's, it's, it's remarkable. And then when you see the African Commission, the Ogoni case, and you see what regional courts have done in Africa, saying, well, the treaties give us broad uh, jurisdiction and we will do something with that. And both courts, uh, ECOWAS and the uh, East African court, have actually delivered very, very encompassing and, and interesting judgments. Um, Latin America has had to wait. The texts were, were not as clear, but still, uh, recently, the Inter-American court with uh, its famous advisory opinion of uh, 2017 has gone very far also uh, in terms of uh, in, in, in all respects, including uh, 
the, the due diligence as being not only uh, an obligation of conduct, but of, of result, uh, the importance of the individual rights of, uh, to a healthy environment, uh, the precautionary principle as being indeed uh, part of customary international law, etc. These, and when I look at Europe, unfortunately, I see that we are traditionally so formalistic that judges, um, it's true that the European Convention, for example, uh, has to link uh, environmental cases to individual civil rights. Otherwise, it has no jurisdiction to pronounce on those cases. So that's a uh, limitation. And the, uh, in the European Union, there has been a very rich uh, environmental legislation, secondary legislation, and there are in the basic text, the constitutive text as well, important provisions to, to defend the, the protection of the environment. But as it is very well explained in the book, when it comes to, for individuals, NGOs, etc., civil society, to go ahead, they are blocked by the formalism of this um, uh, legal or judicial architecture. Uh, as, as you know, uh, to, for an NGO or for an individual to obtain the annulment of an act of a European institution is almost impossible if the individual or the NGO is not the direct addressee. So it's on the, the, the European continent, there is more to do. Now, Mamadou referred to the uh, state of uh, compliance of, of, of decisions. Um, this is, of course, a, a, ser a serious issue because uh, courts and tribunals can do their best, but they lose their credibility if their decisions are not implemented. But it is, again, a question of political will to um, adopt instruments which could at international, at universal global level for the ICJ, there is a possibility to go to, as you know, to the Security Council if a party does not comply with a judgment of the court. But in other systems, it's not so the mechanisms of, of um, to monitor the compliance with decisions are, should be improved to give, uh, uh, no, national courts are privileged in that because of course they are fully integrated in the apparatus of the state and they have been on the substance uh, really audacious. They, they, they have been courageous. Uh, there are so many cases you referred to, your agenda, <laughs> well known, or the Shell case or, or many others in France and now the, the constitutional court in Germany. So, Globally speaking, I am rather optimistic because I see that awareness is there, that there is a certain movement in the right direction, but uh, there is very often a lack of political will. Um, and of course, we the, the same lack of political will is present uh, when uh, dealing with other ways of making uh, uh, environmental law effective. Uh, the political uh, ways, for example, it, it seems obvious to me that climate change uh, has, of course, uh, direct effect on human rights, but also on peace and security, because you imagine the effects in a few years with uh, the sea level raising the migration states which could disappear, borders which can, could change, um, massive phenomena of migration, etc. This is all potentially, these are all potentially problems of peace and security. And uh, that's why I found it interesting that in the book, there is a short section on the Security Council because I find it really uh, lamentable that the Security Council just continues to function with the traditional cleavage divisions 
between states and do, does nothing. Despite many efforts by some states in the Security Council to move and to... So at all levels, and also, of course, uh, I'm also referring to, to uh, uh, all those bodies, treaty bodies, uh, monitoring uh, the, the implementation of international conventions and to compliance mechanisms inserted in, in certain treaties, in particular, for example, the Paris Agreement. Now, I think the International Court of Justice can do more. It has done quite a lot, I think with the limited uh, means at its disposal. I also think that uh, a priori, the uh, advisory uh, procedure is probably more interesting than the contentious procedure, but there are more obstacles to uh, initiate uh, uh, and to, to go at, until the end of a contentious procedure with a clear decision of the court, because you have all those jurisdictional approaches, uh, uh, ob obstacles. You have then the exercise of the jurisdiction. Sometimes there can be obstacles. In particular, I think in matters of climate change, because you have uh, had, I have already heard arguments uh, to the effect that, well, if you accept the case, uh, concerning climate change, a bilateral case, for example, since all states are potentially responsible for climate change, the court will not be able to exercise its jurisdiction, if it has jurisdiction, because it will affect the, the, the rights and legal interests of third states, which it cannot do without their consent. It's the famous uh, monetary court <laughs> uh, jurisprudence which I don't think it's right because the court, uh, I'm not going to enter into details, but the court can perfectly rule on the responsibility of state A. Uh, and that can have indirect effects on state B, but without having to rule on the, the rights, the actual rights of state B. Uh, and that's not the, the monetary world. In the monetary gold case, the court declined to exercise its jurisdiction because in order to uh, rule on Italy's uh, claims, it had first as a prerequisite to rule on the rights of Albania, which was a third state, not part in the procedure. I think that's not the kind of obstacle we should normally have uh, in contentious procedures concerning climate change. And also, you have the traditional problem of, of locus standi uh, before the court. Uh, you know that the International Court of Justice in one of its worst judgments in 1966 in the Southwest African cases said that there is no actual popularis before the court. But in the meantime, international law ha has evolved quite uh, quickly because uh, obligations obligations are now recognized as a reality. And I think in particular in climate change issues, uh, there are obligations ega omnes. And so there should not be problems of local standing uh, before the court. But then uh, another obstacle for contentious proceedings is that uh, the judge is, of course, seized of submissions from the parties, and uh, the judge cannot rule beyond uh, what we call the petitum, the, the submissions of the parties. So it can be very narrow. And then at the end of the day, if the case goes until the end and the court is able to rule, and even uh, if uh, provisional measures are indicated or a process of intervention in third states is initiated, the court will render a decision which will mostly interest the two parties and will in any case be only binding on those two parties. 
I like the advisory opinion because uh, it's far more flexible. Uh, the only requirement is that the court uh, has jurisdiction and the court has jurisdiction when it is seized by a competent organ and when, when the question asked is a legal question. That's all. It's extremely simple if you compare with contentious proceedings. So that's very easy. Uh, the problem is to choose the right uh, organ to request the advisory opinion. Now, climate change is, of course, a very global issue, and the General Assembly is certainly the right organ. But the General Assembly is also the overall organ, the democratic organ of the organization. And therefore, uh, to have a majority of votes, you have to work very hard. And you have to negotiate about the question you will, you will ask. And that is very tricky because you start with your experts and you have finally reached a stage where you have a good question. Questions to be efficient before the court should be brief and should be extremely clear. I remember the FIDA advisory opinion, it was a disaster because the questions were so complex and this, this really um, was counterproductive. The court was, so you need, clear and, 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 and simple questions. And that is very difficult to negotiate because those who have experience of uh, negotiations in the General Assembly know that every group wants to add this or take this out and add that then and take this then out, etc. And at the end of the day, if you want to reach a consensus to have a good majority, Sometimes uh, the question is not ideal, but that is a very important process and you should be very careful for that. Another problem, I saw the draft, I didn't see the, the last drafts uh, of, advice, of an advisory opinion concerning climate change, but I saw the last draft concerning of the fourth committee concerning Palestine. And I was amazed to see that they forgot to ask for an urgent advisory opinion of the court. This is fundamental. There is a provision in the rules, Article 103 of the Rules of Court, which obliges the court when the requesting organ says we require an urgent uh, advisory opinion. And I think in matters, everybody here recognizes that climate change is a very um, uh, urgent matter. So the draft resolution should certainly include that, a reference to that. Now, the advisory opinion, what I like is also the fact that it, thanks to the procedure as provided for in Article 66 of the statute, it is, a plat it is almost a universal, universal platform of discussion. All states, and even not states, uh, public uh, organizations and somehow NGOs can take part in the discussion. And that, that is extremely, extremely positive. And normally the court organizes two rounds of written proceedings and one round of oral proceedings. So everybody has really the opportunity to express itself it is a real, it's nice because it's, it's, it's an open, open debate at universal level. Everybody interested is there. And then because the court does not have to rule on rights of parties as in contentious proceedings, the court, everything is more flexible. The court can redraft the question asked if necessary and the court can go beyond, as it did in, for example, in the legality of uh, the use or threat of nuclear weapons. The court added a last chapter on uh, the Treaty of Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, which was not at all included in, in the request. But the court can do that because there is no risk of ruling ultra petita. There is no petitum. 
And finally, because I think I'm too long, but finally, um, what I would like to stress as well is that very often advisory opinions are considered as having a, a great defect, and that is that they are not binding. But this is not important for such important questions because in contentious proceedings, the judgments of the court are binding, but are binding only on the two or three parties, not on the rest. And therefore, I, at the end of the day, there is no difference. Yes, the difference is that everybody participated and everybody is expecting from the court something, there is a kind of psychological pressure on the court. After having seen so many states and organizations, you know, insisting on that, you have to uh, be proactive and you have to answer in a, in a, and as Mamadou said, the, I agree with that. I think the, the, the great uh, decisions of the court on international law, most of them were advisory opinions. Yeah? Think of the war, think of the Western Sahara, all important principles. Uh, developed by the court in a more open way in, in advisory proceeding. And the last word, now, the responsibility ultimately when an, an advisory opinion is delivered lies with the requesting body because uh, I very often hear people complaining but it was not implemented. It was not implemented. Uh, states are not responsible for that. The requesting body receives the advisory opinion. It is the addressee of the, 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 the advisory opinion. And it depends on what that requesting body is going to do with it. Uh, unfortunately, such an important advisory opinion as the uh, war in Palestine advisory opinion was left almost without effect. Why? Because of the traditional divisions within the General Assembly. There were some statements, of course, of the General Assembly. The court said that, and all states are invited to, but that was it. So we come back to my starting point. It's all a question of political will of individual states, but also uh, of international organizations, and in this case of advisory opinions of the requesting body. Stop here. <laughs>